November 13th, 2017, and today I'm here with... Mark Mothersbaugh. Excellent. And let's just start right here. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Akron, Ohio. It was the rubber capital of the world at the time. Oh, wow. And, uh, and what college did you go to? Kent State University in neighboring Kent, Ohio. Okay. And uh, Kent State, of course, famous for the... Kent May 4th shootings. Mm -hmm. And were you involved with those, that protest scene? Yeah, I mean, um, I had joined SDS a few days, a few weeks before that. Uh, they they uh, had put out a pamphlet that said, watch us napalm a dog on the student campus, uh, at the student union. And uh, I thought, wow, I got to go see that. That can't really be true. And I went and they had a dog in a in an area and they had a box with, with their napalm and they talked about the reason they were doing it was so that people could see what napalm did to a living organism and then they described what it was going what we were going to see is and that was like the napalm would touch the dog but it wouldn't it wouldn't go out it would keep burning until it burnt through the through the flesh into the internal organs uh, and Everybody's kind of shocked, and, and they said, "Who's going to stop us?" And everybody said, "I am." And they, and they were. It was a very, very successful rally because they said, "Well, if you feel that way about this dog, how about all the people that our country is napalming in your name every day over in Vietnam?" And so, I signed up, you know. And uh, within a couple of weeks, things escalated to the point of the shootings. Um, they shut down the campus. It was May 4th, so spring quarter wasn't over yet. Uh, they shut down the campus until fall, September, and um, I had all my art supplies. I had all my art stuff there, but I couldn't really screen print. That's where I used to, I was in love with screen printing at that point in my life and knew that was what I wanted to do forever and ever and ever was to, because it was like, there was no computers yet, and there was, or at least none that I could touch or had any, uh, any awareness of. And so, so um, I, one of the other guys that I went to school with, we started writing music together, and we were trying to determine what it was that we had just seen happen and what was going on in our world with, with, uh, uh, you know, the. Vietnam War, um, uh, shootings at our school, killings at our school, and decided that what we were observing was not evolution, but rather de-evolution. And so we wrote music to that effect, too, as uh, good musical reporters that we were, uh, and um, enthusiasts of agitprop, and wanted to be part of that. So. And did you did you see you sort of your early Devo work as being protest music? Well, um, we were questioning everything that we were seeing going on around us, and we saw our duty was to, and what we wanted to do is use the music to talk about things. It's kind of what happened in the country after there was this summer of uh, of. Uh, uh, revolution in the US and there were shootings at a number of campuses and there were riots at a number of campuses but in American fashion it, when it got too real for everybody they all kind of like put their heads in the sand and everybody went to sleep and there were no Bob Dylan's uh, in 1971 what instead what you got was you got disco and you got um, basically corporate rock you got like um, like White Rock, where it was like uh, guys on stage uh, that were singing, I'm white, I'm a misogynist, and I'm proud of it, and I'm a conspicuous consumer. And then disco was just kind of, uh, we described it, I remember describing disco as uh, a woman with a beautiful body but no brain. And so we decided we wanted to do something different. And that leads us right seamlessly into the music section. <laughs> so what were your early band experiences? Are you, do you mean before Devo or? Oh yeah, leading up to and Devo. Uh, when I was 12, 
I saw uh, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. It totally was uh, a revelation to me. And I realized why I'd spent my whole life learning how to play the keyboard and all that horrible music that I had to play was so I could be in a band like those guys. And so, um, so at 12, I decided I wanted to be in a band and I had uh, bugged the crap out of my parents until they finally bought me a $285 Farfisa organ. And um, even then it was like, there, it, wasn't, it wasn't always, wasn't a straight shot uphill, I have to tell you that. I was like, I remember uh, I rented, I, I bought sheet music and my friend Ronnie Wyszynski who played accordion, we started playing on, on this home organ that, I, that we had at my parents' house, a little Hammond M3 and he'd come over and play on accordion. And, and after about a week or two of playing Hard Day's Night sheet music, I realized the Beatles didn't have an accordion or an organ in their band. And I was like totally distraught. I went, I wasted my whole life learning the wrong instrument. I remember being really upset about it until about another week later. And uh, Ed Sullivan goes, and back by popular request the Beatles and they came out and they did help I think I think was what they played the second time and I remember watching them and being like why didn't I learn how to play a guitar or a drum well, how did I get why am I playing this stupid I was really depressed and then you know they played two songs whoever was the music guest always played two songs in the show so they came back and he goes, okay, and now again the Beatles. But this time when they came out, there was something weird going on on stage because where they'd been in this exact same position with, you know, Paul and uh, whoever, there were two of them would lean in and sing on the same mic and one of them had his own mic and then there was a drum kit. And it was very, it was, they looked exactly the same except this time somebody was sitting down at what looked like a card table and it, we get in closer and they're doing a song called I'm Down. And they, you get in closer and it's John Lennon sitting at a card table. And then the camera comes in and wait a minute, that's not a card table. I didn't know what a Vox Continental was, but I'm like, that not only isn't a card table, it's an electric key, keyboard. And only the Beatles would have one where the black keys were white and the white keys were black. That's insane. Where did they even find something like that? That was incredible. And, and then he did a solo in the middle. And being a good little white kid from Akron, Ohio in the 50s and the beginning of the 60s, I'd never heard of Little Richard or, or uh, any of the, uh, the American uh, blues players so when he when John Lennon in the middle of his solo he's banging away and then all of a sudden he starts using his elbow I just remember thinking Mrs. Fox never told me you could use your elbow to play and I as soon as it was over I just called Ronnie Wyszynski up on the I said the Beatles had an organ they did not have an accordion and I was like that's that's when I set off on my quest for a Farfisa <laughs> and, and what sort of music were you playing early on what kind of music? What were you playing early on? Here? Early on, I was just we were just doing top forty music. So, I I played in bands that that would play things like um, like uh, the Music Explosion, or uh, they'd play Motown. We'd play we'd make an attempt to play Motown songs, or or we'd play like the Leaves, Hey Joe, you know, and uh, Question Mark and the Mysterians, stuff like that. So. So I was playing just, you know, what I heard on the radio and, and thought was just incredible music at the time. Oh, excellent. Okay, and what kind of influence did playing with uh, Gary Casale have on you? Playing with what? With Gary. Jerry. Not Gary. <laughs> Jerry Casale. Well, we were both artists, and so and he was a little bit older than me, but he was in a blues band. I, I had been kind of more experimental and uh, was interested in stuff like John Cage and Morton Sabotnik and and prog rock even, you know, and like people like, like uh, you know, Robert Fripp and, and King Crimson, things like that. And he and uh, so when he was playing like boom, 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 just basic blues things, I'd be playing like mortar blasts and ray guns and and uh, 
and poisonous gas clouds. And so uh, we were kind of like uh, Flintstones meets the Jetsons is, is the way we, we thought about what we were doing back then. Oh, wow. Uh, and so actually I want to talk a little bit about, uh, was your first introduction to uh, Spotnik uh, Green Apples of the Moon? Silver Apples uh, of the Moon. Uh, well, we had that, but, but I think even before that, he came to, um, I think it was right before uh, the shootings, he came in the spring of 1970 or, the, or even, you know, like January, February, March area. He came to, he visited my campus and I saw him perform live. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was my introduction to Morton, oh, wow. who's still around. Oh, yeah, yeah, and still, we, still doing great stuff. We had breakfast together a couple of years ago at Moogfest. Oh, excellent. Oh, wow. So as an art student at that time, mm -hmm. how did you see the influence of your work in your art studio work and such on your music and vice versa? Well, they came from the same place. And even, early, even earlier than that, uh, when I was seven, I, I knew I was going to be a visual artist. Uh, I got my first pair of glasses and all of a sudden I went from being an, uh, legally blind, which I, nobody even knew I was, but I was somehow made it all the way through second grade without even being able to see anything, to all of a sudden I got these glasses on the last week of second grade and it was like, oh my God, there's, that's what a roof looks like and that's clouds. I've seen photos of them up close, but I've never seen the real thing. And it was, it was just this whole, transformation that made me say I want to be an artist so I always I always felt like both things were part of the same came from the same place from even from really young uh, and by the time I got to college it was already you know um, there were there was you know art uh, conceptual art was like very accepted by then so it's like the idea that that the materials and the techniques were second to the idea that followed the idea and you could use whatever materials and techniques you wanted. Um, I, I embraced that and, and I loved printmaking, but I also loved uh, making, you know, uh, uh, hydrogen bomb sounds on my computer, so on my synthesizer, so. Oh, cool. Okay, and so this is a bit of a conceptual question. Uh, what sort of influence did the state of technology have on the Devo concept? Uh, well, I think it was, we always had a healthy interest in technology. We loved new technology when we saw things, but we were also, we were also fairly skeptical. And so to me, there were artists that, that I thought their artwork looks like they worship technology. And there were, you know, especially in entertainment industry, uh, I just thought that's, you know, I think I just see it as something to use or to misuse and make it more interesting than it was intended to be. And because of that, it's like um, when my younger brother, my youngest brother, Jim, was playing, he was the first drummer in Devo. And he, um, he was into electronics pretty heavy and he used to take all of our gear and modify it and make it do things it wasn't supposed to do just because he liked doing it. And then I loved the sound of that. I loved the way we sounded, especially in the very early days. It was really much more radical than, than once we started playing clubs. Yeah. And, and some of those were, that would be seen as called circuit bending today. That's exactly the, the correct term. Uh, what he was doing was um, primordial circuit. I mean, there were other circuit benders for real back then. There were other people doing that. We were part of, uh, there was a lot of people that were all curious about technology and what, how to use it, misuse it, uh, uh, pervert it, make it better, uh, you know, correct it. You know, there were other people that were doing circuit bending, but Jim was, was a pretty honest, you know, direct, interest that, that I, I, uh, I supported and, and influenced because I wanted my band to sound like that. All right. Um, and do you remember the first time you actually heard a synth? 
A synth? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I didn't really like a lot of the synth uh, music that was that first came out. Uh, early synth music was like maybe Rick Wakeman or uh, Keith Emerson, who I liked before he had a synth. I liked him when he was in the Nice, and he was doing everything he could to um, to uh, deconstruct a Hammond B3 on stage, and uh, it was really interesting. And then, then he, he started Emerson, Lake and Palmer, and I thought the music sounded like like aggressive calliope music, but not that interesting. And the same with, I thought these guys were like just making their keyboards sound like silly organs, you know, instead of sounding better. And the first time that somebody did something that really shocked me and changed me and changed my attitude about synths was um, Brian Eno. And that was um, a throwaway song on the first Roxy album called Editions of You. And you know, it's like, it's not a great song and it's, it's just this music playing really fast. And then it, it's a chance for the guys in the band to do this old like stage kind of thing where everybody's taking solos, but it got to his solo and he did this thing where he went, it was like smearing the sound. He went, wow. Wow, wow, wow. And then, then at the end, it goes, and I was like, how did he do that? You know, how do you do that? Uh, you know, what, what, what makes you able to play a synthesizer like that? And, um, uh, you know, I, I started investigating who this guy Eno was, you know, and found out he had something called a EMS, it was a synthesizer, it was the AKS, uh, Synthy, Synthy AKS it was called. And it was, got one in the other room, but it was like a suitcase that looked like a secret agent's briefcase. And you opened it up and it had all these patch pins that I hadn't seen before on an American synth, but it had a joystick, which was the controller that he used. And, and it, was, it was like, for me, knowing how he did that, made me think about how I played synthesizer in another way. And I really, and right about that same time, Devo opened up on a Halloween in Cleveland for Sun Ra. And I watched him play like this. And he just had a electric piano, but I said, he looked like a baby. It was amazing. It was, he was just playing like this on the keyboard and he, saying, you know, 25 years till the 21st century, 21st century, 25 years, or something, I, you know, songs like that. And I was like, this guy's pretty great. And, and um, so I, it made me purposely think about being wary of the keyboard on my mini mode because I, I got uh, one of the first mini modes uh, just because um, I found out about them and, and uh, drove to, I think it was uh, Buffalo area, somewhere around Buffalo that was the first Bob Moog uh, factory, which was actually a barn that had like 50, I, I walked in and there were 50 mini Moogs in the process of being built on these, what looked to me like a mile high tall, you know, wall. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is the, I feel like I'm in a spaceship or something, and, and but it was a barn <laughs> outside of uh, Buffalo. And I came back and uh, uh, played that synthesizer probably more than any synthesizer I ever played since then. Oh, wow. And so how did synth, how did the incorporation of synthesizers change your musical approach? Uh, well, it freed me up and it made it easier to become really um, conceptual about it, conceptual about what you're doing. And you could talk about, your, you could think of your songs as ideas. And so when we, you know, depending on what song it was, I, I really thought about what I wanted my sound to be like. And um, I thought about sound effects and sound design. I mean, there was also this other thing going on where I remember Time Magazine right around the time that, that uh, of the Kent State riots, about a year or two later, they were, they, they talked about a CIA um, 
program where they were using sound to try to, to for crowd control. And in, in the article they said that they there were some studies that have been done that high-pitched frequencies affected your um, you in ways that were similar to orgasmic patterns. And then they, they said, in, but in the same article they said that subsonic tones could make you lose control of your bowels. And so the government was experimenting with using these trucks with giant speakers that could that could blast out subsonic tones to try and like uh, um, have an effect on you know like like um, a protest you know march or a, or um, some sort of a of something on campus that that was getting out of control for them. They would just go, okay, let's make them all poop their pants. They go, <laughs> and so I loved the idea, and I just thought, oh, that's so great. This is the perfect Devo concert. This is like 1974, 75. I'm thinking the perfect Devo concert is going to be, we're going to get a big tent outside. We'll, um, everybody will come in. We, instead of dancing, we'll have organized calisthenics that everybody does along to all the songs. And then somewhere along the line, we'll make everybody poop their pants. And then we'll make them all have an orgasm. And then we'll just hose them all down at the end of the night. And you know, we just had all these ideas of things we wanted to do that we were going to involve electronics <laughs> and that we're going to make the concert uh, experience even better. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Um, You'd have to dress for the occasion, of yeah, course, but yeah. you know. Maybe all that water around the electronics might not be good. Well, it's, you know, a different kind of merch, you know, <laughs> your adult diapers that say Devo on the, that, on the backside. That's brilliant branding. Um, so what, what are your favorite synths that you've used? In my whole life? Yeah. Probably my very first Mini Moog. It was like, I would, I would compare that to like, um, like uh, somebody who just joins the army and they get an AK-47 and you learn how to put on a blindfold and take it apart and put it back together. I could, to this day, I could take a Mini Moog, set it here, you could say Smart Patrol, and I could, with a blindfold on, I could, I could, through touch alone, I would know how to set all the, all the parameters to sound like uh, the reverse sawtooth. Oh, wow. Okay. And now... Uh... Which isn't to say that I haven't been unfaithful to the Mini Moog at times, because I love new things in my life, so... So, you know, both other retro synths and modern technology have, like, uh, have, like, um, amazed me throughout my life. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find yourself trying to recreate your Mini Moog in with your modern systems? You know, it's, it's not as easy as you would think. And that particular song I just said, Smart Patrol, mm -hmm. there aren't reverse sawtooths on many synths. And as a matter of fact, when, um, what's the one that, uh, Moog did, like about 10 years ago, was it a Voyager, or oh, what was yeah, it called? The, Voyager. Yeah, I think it was Voyager. Uh, I got one of those, and I couldn't believe it that there was no, I'm, I had them add a reverse sawtooth onto mine so I could still do Smart Patrol, because I couldn't even perform it, but it's, you know, it involved like using Portamento and, and on and off switches, and uh, mm -hmm. it's a lot of hand, co constantly touching it to make it sound like that. And do you find it to be a different physical sensation playing a synth as opposed to playing just like a regular keyboard? A regular keyboard? Or a, a, a piano keyboard. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's, and it, it, it is different, but it's different like in the way like oil paints and uh, pastels or acrylics are, are different, you know? It's like, you bring to it what you have, and then whatever the the right instrument is, that's what's important, you know. And and you can make as much a mistake by choosing the wrong keyboard as you can by just writing a crappy song in the first place. I have to remember that the key note. <laughs> um, so you have an impressive collection of synths, and uh, actually, we're going to look at some of them later, right? We can look at some of them. Okay. Yes. Uh, but let me ask you about Bob Moog. Okay. And so tell me about your relationship with Bob Moog and 
uh, certainly your admiration for the guy. Yeah, we became um, aware of each other. Very, I mean, I knew about him long before he knew about me, but when Devo came out, we early on he asked us to do ads for the company, and and so we did. We were glad to like, like, what are the that the liberation, which I never played on stage. I felt it was kind of a little too kitschy, so I never. But I but I liked us posing with it, like like we all had like we were uh, somewhere between some weird sport and some sort of a sort of a um, you know. Uh, a soldier or something, you know, with these with these kind of strange instruments. I, I liked that, but but we start off early on, and and he he would sometimes loan me things like uh, the Moog vocoder, uh, which probably was one of the best. Where the early ones, the early Moog vocoders were amazing, uh, the filters in them, and then um, he. Uh, announced that he was going to make a theremin. you want me to tell that? Oh, absolutely. Okay, are you editing this by any chance? Good, okay, because I'm... And, uh, okay, so Bob Moog announced that he was going to make a Moog theremin, which I thought was great. What a great idea, a perfect company to do it. And when in, in the article it said that he was going to add MIDI to it. And I thought, oh, that's fantastic for all the guys like me that all we can do is make it go and can never get the right pitch and it's so hard to play. I thought, what a great idea to put MIDI into the, into the mix. And so um, I called him and said, Bob, I, wanna, I want the very first uh, theremin, so I'm going to give you the money now. So I, he said, okay. He was happy to take my money. And then I called him about every month or so going, are you done yet? And after about a year, he's going, man, he says, I I'm sorry, but it's taking so long. It's a lot more complicated than I thought. And I was still calling him every month. Is it done yet? Is it done yet? And he finally said, I'm going to send you something and you have to stop calling me if I send this to you. And it, he sent me um, a memory Moog that was his personal memory Moog. I still have it. And all of the sounds in it, he had he programmed so I have and it also the circuitry was a little bit different than the memory modes that came out and so it has this kind of really it has amazing sound has a really great sound and uh, so I've just made sure it always works and take care of that and and uh, I used it just recently in uh, uh, the Thor Ragnarok movie Excellent. now how did you come into possession of the electronium Electronium, uh, I got a call from a friend of mine who wrote for, uh, he still does, he writes for different tech magazines, uh, recording tech, and he said, hey, I'm going to go interview uh, Raymond Scott, would you like to come with me? And I'm like, he's alive? Of course. So I, I went with, with him, and um, in the process saw his uh, studio, which was a guest house behind his house that had fallen into disrepair and like his tapes and his discs, uh, he, had, he had acetates of live shows, when radio shows, and it would say like Ella Fitzgerald singing with the Raymond Scott band and, and a date. And there was stacks of stuff like that that were all, that nobody had ever listened to again since he just w had the, the wherewithal to record these shows and these programs, you know, like Frank Sinatra singing uh, live on the radio back in the day, and he had all this stuff. And I uh, had this work in progress. It was the uh, Electronium. Everybody had seen pictures of it, and we all knew about it because he had done articles where he had said, it's the first machine that writes music by itself, and it never writes the same song twice. Um, that had a little something to do with sample and hold, which he was an early pioneer in, and, and he was doing all this stuff back then. And um, he passed away not long after that. And uh, so his wife was just getting rid of everything, and she, the place was a mess, and she was just sweeping it up, and she was putting things in boxes, and um, I said, you know what, you need his 
his intellectual properties need to be protected. So along with Erwin Schusig and uh, Mr. Banzai, the, we, we connected her up with uh, the University of Missouri that they do have a repository for intellectual archives of composers. So they took all the sheet music, they took all these tapes, they took all his um, discs and a lot of his, his uh, things that were around the place, but the electronium weighed a, a ton. Like literally, it was like really heavy. And uh, she didn't know what to do with it and she was gonna just send it to the to Goodwill or Trash Heap or something. And so um, I took possession of it. She was happy to get rid of it. Um, do you remember the first time you ever saw a computer? Yes. Um, I was going to Kent State. Um, I, uh, it was in the, um, there was like an educational resources room where they had this incredible typewriter I, I always look for on eBay and never can find, but it had like three eighths of an inch high type. It was for like grade school, like for a grade school teacher to type up, uh, things and I always want one of those but I, I remember I used it in there I used I'd made crazy pamphlets like these Dada pamphlets on my own back then in the like 1970s yeah um, one of the other students said hey there's gonna be this amazing art class uh, this spring it's called materials and techniques and it's a conceptual art class and there I didn't even know that there were such thing as teaching conceptual art. So, uh, but I was told that you had to be a grad student to sign up for it. And, and this person who was a grad student said, hey, I know you're only a sophomore, but you know what? They they're just started using this new computer system at Kent. So they don't have everything programmed right. Just fill out all the blanks that you've taken all the prerequisites necessary and just get in the class. It's just important you do it. You have to do it. And so I did. I got in this class and uh, the computer didn't catch me. It just let me in. <laughs> oh, excellent. And, and do you remember what the computer was or? No, I, I remember not. I wasn't impressed because my knowledge of computers had to do with movies from the 60s. And so it would be like I, I knew of computers as being like a whole room with like these fake you know, like wheels moving and blinking lights, and then uh, and then somebody like um, like Annette Funicello would would put a card in it or something backwards, and <laughs> then all of a sudden it would start spitting cards out everywhere, and there'd be a whole mess. And computers, uh, they weren't impressive to me when when I first when I saw my first computer, I wasn't impressed with it. Oh wow. Okay, so as your career in music has gone forward, and you've seen, of course, computers becoming more and more ingrained in uh, the methodology, so how does the computer change your work as a composer? Well, early on, probably early 80s. No, early, late 70s, early 80s. I mean, the first computers I probably worked with would be like, these little dedicated computers that were inside like uh, an S100 Roland sequencer keyboard. So they were just these things that were part of the keyboard I was buying. And um, I think the first standalone computer that I ever owned was a Fairlight 2. Okay, will do. And uh, it changed the way I thought about music in a lot of ways. And um, you know, it, one of the things it did was it, it freed me from being in a band to, uh, to being able to write things for a, for a film or a TV show uh, just pretty much all by myself. I didn't really require other people to be with me to, to you know, for me to be able to put it all down because you could play right into this computer. And to me, that was so transparent and so powerful. It was like, uh, you know, because you played it in when you had the idea. So it really became about, 
conceptual art, uh, writing music to me. It became this thing that I totally uh, understood of being able to write a piece and then it's, per then it's permanent into the sequence. Then I wrote another piece and it, it was all additive and um, it, it enabled me to go from the, that when uh, my band, we, had, we were on Warner Brothers and then left them after doing five albums that did really well, but then we got in a fight with them and we went to this company called Restless. And uh, within the first month we were there, they started to go under. And uh, so Devo kind of went into this kind of um, unwanted, uh, you know, cocoon siesta hibernation state. And, and you know, before that I'd done five albums. You know, you write 12 songs, you rehearse them, you go record them, you go, you, you start playing them for a tour, you design costumes and, and a stage show, you go out on tour, and a year later you come back and you write 12 more songs. And then you rehearse them, record them, you know, go play them on a stage, go out on tour, and then you write 12 more songs. Well, a friend of mine in 1984-ish, uh, I can't remember the exact year, but I think that's when it was, said to me, Mark, would you score my TV show? Uh, it's called Pee Wee's Playhouse. And I said, oh, uh, yeah, I got time right now. We're kind of locked in a lawsuit. So he sent me a tape on a Monday. On Tuesday, I wrote 12 songs worth of music. On Wednesday, I recorded it. On Thursday, I took the tape, a two inch tape, and sent, a half inch tape, and I sent it to New York where he was editing his show. Friday, they cut it into the show. Saturday, it was on TV. We watched Pee Wee's Playhouse in the morning. Monday, he sent me another tape. And Tuesday, I wrote 12 more songs. I was like, sign me up for this job. I love this. It was like all about the creative process. It was all about writing more songs and writing more music. And it was conceptually, it was, you know, we'd gone to the, through this period where early on we got signed because, well, David Bowie and Brian Eno think they're great. So, and, you know, We'll sign them, but we already have Captain Beefheart, and we already have Frank Zappa and, and Wild Man Fisher, but we'll add another weirdo band to the, to the list. So they kind of ignored us, even though we made them money. But then once we put out Whip It, and they had um, a platinum record, then all, and then all of a sudden it became a thing where we'd be working on writing music for the next album. You'd look over, and there'd be somebody from Warner Brothers going, hey, can, you guys need anything? Keep up the good work. Just whatever you do, remember to write another whip it, you know. It was like that kind of a thing and, and it kind of became like destructive. It became this, this, this destructive force. And so when I started writing for Pee Wee's Playhouse, my only criterion was Paul said, well, if it's something happy, make it really, really happy. And if the scene is is scary, make it really scary. And if it's sad, make it really sad. And he just said, make it extreme. And so I could do any kind of music I wanted. And, you know, I was writing all this music and I would like do parodies of my music or talking heads or TV commercials. You just change it so that you didn't have a, have a, a you know, a copyright infringement problem. But it was like, I was in this world where it was, it was all about writing music, and I, I loved it very much. Oh, excellent. Um, okay, so have you ever had any contact with the sort of the research side of music, sort of the, the scientists who are actually trying to do music-y, computer-y, electronic-y stuff? Well, um, during the Devo years, um, companies that were building things, everybody sent stuff to us. Everybody wanted us to beta test for them, and they wanted us to try out you know, I mean, even companies like Casio, everybody would, I'd be in Japan and, and Casio would come up and they'd go, here, take this, it's our new keyboard. And I'd get a keyboard from them or, or you know, um, and everybody just wanted Devo to use their gear. So I got to try out all these things and I got to talk to people about what they thought was interesting. And my brother, who, Jim, who we're talking about again here, but he, Pretty soon after he started playing with Devo, uh, he was in our first film. It was 
my two brothers, Jerry and me, in our first Devo film. But pretty soon after that, he just wanted to work on drums and electronics. He ended up um, touring with us and then met up with Roland and wanted, and they asked him to come work with them. And he kind of represented Roland during the years that MIDI was being developed. And so they had, when MIDI was being developed, um, they had representatives from all of the all of the big companies, but a lot of little people too. And so there's this big group of people that are all trying to figure out what is going to be the language that we all use. And so I kind of was a little bit on the inside when that was happening. Okay, and uh, in your current workflow, mm -hmm. where does the computer factor in? At what point do you sort of Sort of go with it. Well, kind of, you know, it's like um, I'm I'm pretty much at a point where like about 95 percent of the music I write starts on a computer. It's like, um, admittedly, I've I hated when I had to go through. Um, I forget what software I used before I used Logic, but then I learned Logic and I loved Logic, and then then I went to digital digital. Uh, what is that called? Digidesign. What's their? Oh, um, whatever that is. Yeah. I went to that software, and I hated having to learn a new language. It was like going from Esperanto to to uh, something else, you know, to German or something. And then, and then, uh, then I started using Logic, and I just didn't even want to learn another musical language. But now, to me, Logic is very. Uh, transparent and so the computer is pretty much where I start for everything I mean I sometimes I'll, I'll have a musical instrument that that actually is the um, is the center point or is the starting point for something or, or inspires something else to happen you know either uh, uh, an accordion or whatever but but it, it's now it's even in my life it's gone to a point where I'm designing musical instruments uh, and I use a computer to control those. Excellent. Sweet. That's exactly what I was hoping for. <laughs> um, okay, just to go a little bit into the, the Fairlight, because you were one of the like golden boys of the Fairlight CMI. Uh, whenever anyone talks about it, they talk about you and Devo. Mm, okay. And so... How did you first hear about it? Oh, I, I don't know. Probably Keyboard Magazine was the first place I ever heard about a fair lot. I don't know for sure because everything was always out there. And I was very interested in technology at the time. And I was very interested in what was being developed. And um, uh, right about the same time, I got a Fairlight. We had also toured uh, Australia already, and you know, so it it was something. And we knew other bands that had already used it. So, so um, so I uh, got Devo to come up with to separate with thirty five thousand dollars and buy a Fairlight Two X, which meant it. I think it had MIDI out outputs, and uh, and. That was something like somewhere around the Shout album is right about when we were doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, what what did it make possible that hadn't been possible before? Well, it was fast, but it also allowed you to create samples, and it allowed you to use. I mean, the thing about like you know a Roland synthesizer where it's all electronic, they would have sounds that were called strings, brass woodwinds, guitar, drums, and it never sounded like any of those things back then. They always, they were like the worst kind of approximations now. And now it's like you love it for, for something totally different than what, but this was 8-bit, so it was pretty low quality to begin with, but they were samples of real instruments. And so, um, I really liked that. I liked the idea of having the ability to uh, blend acoustic instruments in along with my uh, synth tracks. And after working with it for a few months, I realized, 
well, these are even better than acoustic instruments because they sound like the, um, the wood paneling version of real wood paneling. You know, it sounded like, it sounded like vinyl wood or like, or it sounded like a, a, a plastic brick wall version of a brick wall. It didn't really sound like a brick wall, but it sounded like the plastic fake version of it. And so I love the idea that I could write acoustic, plastic acoustic music. And um, I, wrote a, I wrote a bunch of albums that were, I called them music for insomniacs, because I just wrote them for me to, because I wanted something to listen to in the house that was kind of like M.C. Escher meets um, plastic, mu plastic acoustic instruments or something like that. And so, uh, so I, I would let them go on, you know, for a while and I would, they'd have slow, and they couldn't have too many parts because a Fairlight only had eight channels. So, you know, you couldn't get too crazy. And, and, uh, but I liked that because that made it, each part had to be important or essential. It wasn't like just additive, like, uh, what happened later then when technology started allowing people to put like hundreds of tracks on their songs and it all that did was meant that you had a hundred tracks that that weren't essential all playing at the same time oftentimes and uh, so with both the fairlight men in general when you're approaching a new instrument um how does that change how does that change the way that you interact with it and think about it for use in your music? Oh, it's, it's all different. It depends on what kind of instrument you're talking about. Uh, the last the last instrument that um, really made me happy also eliminated my need for a celeste, um, dulcitone, a lot of the keyboards that there's a lot of them just sitting in the studio that are collecting dust because it was um, Keyscape. Uh, I don't know if you, you, you know that software or not, but somebody put together this great collection of keyboard sounds, and it's the stuff that, that Wes Anderson uh, would, love to ha would love to have Keyscape. If he doesn't already know about it, he would, he would love Keyscape on his computer because he loves all those kind of instrumental sounds. But, but um, that was the last one that made me super happy. And, and it's like, I, I've put it in everything ever since I, I got it. It's, it's the, I'm sticking Keyscape and it doesn't matter if it's, um, I, I'm working on a, a new animated show with uh, Matt Groening and I'm, it, I'm putting it in that. And I, I've done five movies so far this year and I've, every single one of them have Keyscape in it. I just happen to really like that instrument right now. I, I mean, I'm not here to give a, a <laughs> testimonial for, for them, but, you know, that just happened to be the one right now. Okay, so uh, Devo's credit as having the first to score a video game, and you've scored video games yourself. Yeah. How is, how is that process different than scoring a film? Oh, you think about video games quite differently uh, than you do, because... Video games, they're a different animal than, than a film. Uh, a film, you watch it, most films you'll watch one time ever in your life. And then maybe you see it a second time, not in the theater, you watch it at home again, and you go, oh yeah, I like that when I saw it. You know, it's Die Hard. Now I'm gonna watch Die Hard 3, you know, or whatever, you know, but whatever you think about the films. But, you know, it's like a video game People play them maybe a thousand times, you know. It's not, or they play them a hundred times, you know. They and they hear that music a hundred times more. So, video games, it's really important to come up with themes that are great because uh, there's often not a lot of dialogue like in a film, and the story, the way it, you know, it's like the arc of a, a story in a film is more like a book or something and in a video game it's this other animal that's growing inside you like maybe a fungus even you know it's kind of like a video game is something where you're going to play level one a thousand times you're going to play level 99 maybe only a couple times but you think about that when you're writing the music and you have to think about things like um i don't know i can't think of the name i did some homer simpson uh video game like five years ago or something, where he's running around a food court 
just to give you an example, is you have to think about the music and you record it totally different than you record the music for uh, a film. Because like this music, I came up with the theme for the first level, you know, and, and everybody liked it. And you know that somebody's going to be playing that level the first time they play it, they might have to play it like five minutes or seven minutes before they get to the next one or, they, or before they get knocked down and have to start over again. And so they're playing it for a long period of time. And then, you know, after you've done the game for a while, then it's like first level, 10 seconds, and you're on to the next level, 10 seconds, and you keep jumping through it. But it's like you have to write the music for both the person that's just starting and the person who's been playing it for six months and so uh, my my take on it is what I do is I like to put like legato and and slower moving you know parts like maybe whole notes or half notes you know that are playing a melody that you you know the melody but it or maybe you don't maybe you're just it's just hinted at and you're hearing it start to move and Homer's going around and then he grabs his burrito and throw and eats it or whatever he does and then then I bring in like more strings for instance maybe and then they're playing quarter notes and they're playing faster a little bit faster so you have a tempo has just doubled and then uh, then he goes and he gets the pizza he was looking for finally finally he gets his pizza and then you bring in woodwinds playing something even playing these little riffs that are playing faster over top of it and then uh, then he gets whatever uh, custard pie and then and then all of a sudden you have the um, the brass are hitting these like ba -ba -ba -da, da -da 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 -da, and, and it's still playing the melody and now you've got the melody and the whole song playing and it's been building and it has to you have to also write it so that when he gets that first uh, Sam his first burrito you have to be able to like as soon as he grabs it the next in set of instruments add in and change the tempo right there it changes it so that it's playing you know you're hearing a double double time going on so it's playing faster and maybe it takes one second because you know how to play the game or maybe it takes you three minutes because you haven't figured it out yet you have to be able to listen to that music for three minutes without wanting to kill the composer and you also have to be able to whether you get it in two minutes and 56 seconds or you get it in one minute and 47 seconds or you get there in three minutes and 33 seconds as soon as you grab it it has to like seamlessly keep going it can't like stop and start up again you have to keep it as as an additive feature so you have to think about that while you're writing your melody and while you're writing your themes and so that by the time the percussion's on the top playing this really crazy shit and then he finally gets to go to the next room it's like a build the whole time and you know you just have to be able to think of it that the build's either going to be on this trajectory of five minutes or it could be 10 seconds it depends on how long they've played the game and and uh it you have to write it thinking about that which is totally different than thinking about the arc of a whole movie and that you're playing you know you're either stating a theme early on or you're just hinting at it and it doesn't totally uh, pay off until you know the climax of the film or, or something you know you have to think you have a you have a different uh, strategy for that than and, and a different methodology for writing so I, I love both of those very much and I see them as different and so because of it, you record different so it's like you may go in and just record uh, the orchestra like the first day you might just record only low instruments and or a certain se instrument set and then the second day you come back and you add on the next layer and then something like that you re you think about it different whereas you know otherwise I love to play the whole orchestra I have I love to have the whole orchestra playing at the same time that feels really good you know and there's less things that can go wrong that way because you as soon as they play it it's either great or you need to do another one. When you're building up, you could get to like the fourth day where you've got the piccolos and the flutes and the clarinets and go, oh, I should have, I should have changed the timing on the cello and the violas, but that's where we are now. So you have to fix it. Uh, 
and that's where you need a good music editor sometimes. Oh, wow. But it's a totally different beast, you know, and that's what makes makes it fascinating to me. I love the idea of, you know, writing in different uh, mindsets with different kinds of concepts behind them. Okay. Um, and when did you start recording digitally? Uh, that's, I think, well, you know, on one level you're recording digitally when you're, you know, rec have an emulator too and you're, you're, you know, like going, Jesus loves you in a microphone and then you hit the reverse button and it goes, we smell sausage. You know, it's like on one level you're already recording digitally, but then you're talking about all the acoustic instruments too getting recorded digitally. I think Pro Tools has, you know, really became important in a in a entertainment world first, you know, and and you know, I mean like uh, commercials and TV shows and films and they were but they were a couple years ahead of me and then I went through like ADATs and uh, a couple of the other systems. I have all I have like eight track tapes that look like this and eight track tapes that look like this in storage and I'm like, well, three of these are, uh, uh, you know, bottle rocket, a real one, you know? And then so, so you have 18 of those tapes like that to, to make up the six reels of the film and, and uh, you have to have three machines all synced up together. And, and uh, now Pro Tools are pretty much the winner in the world of entertainment. So everybody records to Pro Tools, although I love the way my logic sounds, so I, I record just straight into logic usually. It's it's like when my engineer comes over, he's like all like uh, like gets all upset about it and says, "No, you should be just always recording in Pro Tools." And I go, "Well, I'm not. So, too bad. This is quicker and more transparent for me." So, okay. And can I make a quick adjustment? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. a quick adjustment. Just I'm the camera. And I just want to open the door slightly more. Okay. okay. Uh, this is great. I am so happy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Still rolling. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, MP3, what are your thoughts? Um... MP3, uh, I have, I have, uh, uh, there's a time and a place for it. And the only thing I dislike about MP3s is that it's crowded out a lot of higher quality recording. The things I like about it is it's democratizing. It, it allows everybody, it allows kids, it allows, I'm, when I was a kid, I would, uh, I would look at albums and I would go, a recording studio, what is that? And what's a record company? I, I know there's no record companies in Ohio, you know, and, and I would look at these things and it would be confusing. And, and uh, you know, little things happened slowly when I was, when I was younger. I remember seeing a, a Todd Rundgren album that had a big effect on me because it was, you know, it was like Todd Rundgren, it is kind of, sweetest, you know, it was okay, you know, it was, it was, he was always had an interest in technology, which I liked. But the thing about the album that was, that struck me was not the um, music as much as it was the album cover, because, you know, it's like, and back in those days, a big cover, you know, there was all sorts of clues as to what was going on. And I remember seeing this picture, and I could tell it was like a snapshot from a, a you know, like an Instamatic camera or something, like some cheap Kodak or something, home camera that you had to go get developed at the grocery store. But it had like carpeting that was like cheap, you know, bedroom carpeting. And it had a sliding door that was just like the, whatever kind of sliding doors everybody had in houses and still do, you know. But the thing that struck me was that there was this thing that looked like a washing machine sitting in that room that had no furniture in it and wires coming out of it. And I'm looking at this picture and I'm going, there's 
these 16 view meters, like, like on my little uh, cassette deck, my mono cassette deck that has one needle, there's like 16 or 24 of them. There was 24 on this one. And it, and it had like, that looks, that's a reel of tape. And those are, those look like mic cables. And he's in a house. He's not at a recording studio. He's in this house somewhere. And I remember that to me was like such a big thing at the time. And it made me and my brother go out and try to figure out how we could record in our house. And my brother Bob then, he had a, a job delivering meat or something during the day. And he came back one day with this four track tape recorder, a TIAC four track. And we were like amazed. We're like, well, the Beatles recorded their first albums with the four track. We could record an album with this thing. And it was just uh, mind blowing to me that we could have this in our house. I could not believe it. At the time, I thought we were, we were on the edge of technology. We were on the cutting edge. We had a four track TIAC in our house and I could come home after work and I could write a song. Uh, Bob and I could write Blockhead down in the basement and record you know, drums and bass on a couple channels and then we'd record a couple other instruments on two channels and we'd mix it down and then we'd add vocals and a synth solo or a guitar synth solo and uh, we could do it ourselves. And that was, that was like a really big thing in my life. And it made me start writing music much faster. And it was, uh, you know, I, to me, that is, that is something that I see reflected now. Kids don't know it, but it's like um, I watch my my kids. You know, they have an iPad, and they were made a couple of years ago when they were like ten and twelve. They were making these videos. They would make a video on an iPad, and they'd be running around the house with their friends, and they'd make up a song to go with it, and they'd make up a storyline, and then they'd set up the shots, and they'd make this film, and they were just having fun, and they knew nothing about filmmaking or other than intuitive stuff and I was like I remember thinking you little brats do you know how it took me a year to make the first Devo film I had to I had to get a job with Jerry we started a, a, a graphic design studio and we kept it going for like four or five months to make three thousand dollars profit and then we used that to buy film stock and and things and then rent some gear and then we shot the film and then we had to beg people that worked in editing you know rooms to let us edit it and then it took us a year and you guys are like it's totally transparent and effortless and you're just making these this art and and the thing was is like now it's like kids come with a phone you know they can take a phone and there's apps where you can sing a drum line into it you can go boom pop boom boom pop and then it'll quantize you can quantize it then you can like pick what kind of sound you wanted if you wanted an electronic sound what kind of electronic sound do you like um, what kind of acoustic drum kit did you want to have do you want to have a death metal kit or did you want to have a, a a portland garage band sound or you know you could choose whatever you want and then if when you get a drum you don't have to own a drum kit you don't have to own a basement or, or have access to a basement where people aren't going to say turn that shit off you can you don't have to spend hours learning. You can just do that. You can have the idea for a song and you can do it with your mouth. And then you can do that with a bass guitar and you can decide, is that a bass guitar, a bass synth? Is What kind of sound do I want to be? And you can choose some of these instruments. It's a $1.99 app, you know, we're talking about. And it's digital. And then you can do that. You can add on all sorts of instruments. And if you get something you like and you sing over top of it and you mix it and you really like it, you didn't, don't have to go to a recording studio to do that. You don't have to go to a record company and say, will you please release my record? You just go to YouTube and you make a little video of that song. And overnight, the whole world can, can be part of your art or can be exposed to your art. And to me, it's so, I'm so uh, impressed and excited about that. It just seems like... We are in such a great time, and uh, technology has 
I, you know, I mean, I don't want to, you know, make it sound like I'm, de you know, like I'm uh, not giving credit where it's due to, like, the orchestra, the London Symphony that I work with, you know, at Abbey Road a couple times a year that you just hand them a sheet full of music, they look at it, they play it once, then the second time you record it and you're done. And it's like something that's very complicated that follows all, that's maybe you're following Thor through a, through um, a, a battle with um, the Hulk and they're beating each other up and they're, they're getting tossed against the wall and there's, there's all these other things that, you, that are happening in the music and it's, so it's doing hairpin turns where you go from 4-4 four, four to a 5-4 bar and then a 1-8 and then a bar and then the timing tempo changes and then and, uh, these people play it perfect. They're like amazing and that's, a, that's pretty impressive. But the, but the idea of that uh, an artist can has another way to go and that is using technology that's inexpensive and it's available to kids in the Amazon or kids in China or kids, you know, kids anywhere in the world. They can get a hold of this stuff for a small amount of money and they can, they can, you know, they have like recording studios that are more powerful than the Beatles had when they did, or Devo, when we did our first demos. <laughs> You know, I, I just I just think it's an amazing time right now. Oh, excellent. All right. Now we're on to the static art section. The, the say what? The static art section. Okay. Um, so when did you first use a computer in your art creation process? You know, I avoided it for a long time. And uh, it took somebody... It, and I hate to give him credit for this, but it was Henry Rollins who kind of pushed me into it. Uh, he introduced me to this woman who was a, a book publisher, and she came over one day with, with an Amiga computer and just handed it to me. And she said, let's do a book together. And I was like, there's all sorts of games and stuff. When I go to people's houses, they're all using their computers to play games. And I said, I don't want to get distracted because I, I just want to... I'm a serious artist and I just want to be tunnel visioned on my art and but I got this computer and I wrote a book and put images into it because I, I drew every day and um, it was all downhill from there. Um, I had been doing this thing uh, where I used mirrors and I was making symmetrical photographs but you would always see the black line of the mirror where this part that was reflected over here and there was this thing called photoshop and for it was totally simple to do it turned it almost into like a sophomoric like erasing the pupils out of eyes when you're a bored high school kid kind of trick but i did all these things where i made this these symmetrical mutants i called them beautiful mutants and i became obsessed with doing this with photos and started looking i started seeing you know they're humans they all have they're symmetrical but they're not totally symmetrical and there's one half that seems more of the childlike side to a human there's another side that's the more demonic side and almost everybody that i would cut their faces in half and then then flip them all these images i was finding that to be the case and so i i made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those and, and that was my art for a while that I was just doing that and then I don't know just the slope got slipperier I draw every day um mm -hmm. want me to show you something sure I'm gonna I'm gonna show a book which would be a good one every day I draw on paper like this paper's prepared mm -hmm. but I draw I, I did I took this image and put it on that paper because I've been doing a bunch of things where I write poetry around the edge of, edges of that eye. And that's a, that's a subtext to this. But, but I, I draw on paper every day oh. since 19, early, early 70s. I was into mail art is how it started. And I found that a nobody from Akron, Ohio that nobody had ever heard of called Mark Mothersbaugh could take a piece of paper and send it to Robert, Indiana, 
or send it to Jasper Johns or Irene Dogmatic or Mr. Peanut. And there was a good chance they would send something back to me. It was like to get something in the mail from, you know, Robert Indiana was like such a, it was amazing. I felt like I was on the map. It was an amazing thing. So I, and I, I was, so I was doing these drawings all the time, sending them out. And then I was also putting together a band. And in the process of that, I, I was sending something out to somebody and I said, hey, these, this could be, if we ever get to do a record, this could be the cover for it. And I started to put it in the mail and then I said, wait a second, maybe I should be saving this stuff. And so I started this book here. I was a nerdy stamp collector when I was a kid. And I knew that in stamp stores they had these red albums that would hold a hundred um, covers, you know, like envelopes or something. And so they weren't expensive. They were like, back in those days, they were like five bucks for one of these books. But I found that if I had a hundred of these cards, I could take... Uh, I could take these cards and put a hundred of them in one book and then I'd call it book one. Now there's about, I'm closing in on like 400 and something. I don't know how many books there are. Hannah knows because I make her scan them when I bring a new one in. So she knows what the last number is. But but this became like an image bank that, that um, that I would take these images and uh, we would go through and say, that could be our album cover or that could be a single sleeve. And, um, or I would have poetry I would write. I was influenced by Thomas Pynchon back in those days. I loved his books and he always had these, like in a, the middle of his stories, there'd be like somebody would be singing a ditty or he'd hear a TV commercial and it was kind of nonsensical. And, it, and, I, and so I, I would write stuff like that and and it became part of um of this collection and and the collect so I, so the thing i'm what i wanted to say about computers is it used to be all just drawings and collages and then about 15 20 years ago scan i found out about how you could scan things and so on these cards in particular that I'm showing you, uh, I would take something and draw it, and then I could mutate it in the computer, and then I could print it again, and then I could draw over top of that. So like, that's, a, that's my Holy Communion picture when I was a kid. I had fallen off a skateboard about three days before, so I have stitches, I have two black eyes, and, and I was loving it that I had looked like a monster in, in this group photo with everybody. Um, but then, you know, I added, you know, I, I printed it on this piece of paper and then I, I drew over top of it and added things to it. And um, so computer is very important to me in my visual art. Uh, and some of the stuff I do now is musical because I work with every musical instrument and write music for uh, everything from, from uh, you know, Dudex and everything that's in a traditional orchestra, but also for, you know, circuit bent things and whatever. And uh, I decided I wanted to build my own instruments. And that started because of uh, the movie um, Moonrise Kingdom. Uh, Wes Anderson had given me a piece of footage and it was these two kids running across through the woods. They were running away from summer camp. And, uh, but he gave me this footage that didn't have any sound with it. So you saw these tree limbs going like this and you saw birds flying around, but you couldn't hear anything. And I have in this building, I have a large collection of a, you know, hundreds of bird calls. Some of them are 150 years old and some of them are toys, novelty toys, like those things up there I just got because I didn't know if they were going to be any good or not. And they're kind of interesting. They're semi-interesting. But um, I'm always looking for, for uh, sound-making devices. And uh, so, but I looked at this film and I started playing these bird calls. And then I lost interest in the film. And I just wanted to write music for bird calls. So I started playing these things, but it was kind of cumbersome and complicated to go back after being used to 
doing things in the computer to go back to like me playing all those things. But, you know, I hire players. So I'm thinking, OK, so what if I get 40 players to come over and teach each one how to play a different bird call? Like you're going to play a duck call and I want you to make it kind of flaccid sounding. And I want you to make your owl call sound kind of, you know, uh, energetic and, and worried. And that didn't make sense either. But when I sampled things, then it just sounded like samples. It sounded like, like this, like it sounded like this. Totally fake, totally fake sounding. So I found this guy who worked at repairing calliopes for uh, amusement parks. And I told him I wanted to take and make, I wanted some way to make a duck call blow air through it but I wanted to have 50 or 60 different bird calls all together that I could control with air or electricity or with um, gears or whatever and write music on a keyboard for them. But I wanted them to play acoustically. And so he was interested in that and he helped me build uh, one of my first orchestrions. And so since then, now I'm, I'm, I'm working on numbers uh, seven through 12 now. And they're, they're, some of them are similar. I like to use bird calls a lot. They reoccur in my instruments. But like one of them I'm working on now, I have 100-year-old foghorns that, that are like, they look like a bellows that you squeeze with a brass horn on the end. And uh, they make one note. They go boom. And uh, I figured out how to tune those. So now I have 18 of them that are all tuned to different notes. And I have a machine that I can control with MIDI with, with my, um, you know, logic. On, so with my computer, and I control it with a computer and it'll squeeze the horns for me. So I'm building an instrument with 18 of those. And then also Part of that instrument, besides 18 that are all off, can be put all over a room. There are 18, uh, you know those little, when you're a kid, those little toys where you go, meh, where they go, moo. Uh, I'm also building in 18 of those to this. So it'll have 18 foghorns and 18 cow mooers. <laughs> Hopefully I'll be done before the film comes out anywhere, but so nobody does it before me because, but so I'm making things like that. And then like one instrument is, is tubular bells. It's got like about, it's going to have about 30 or 40 tubular bells built into it. And I use a lot of organ pipes just because there's all these decommissioned organs that are 100, 150 years old that it's too expensive to replace all the leather bellows and to, you know, for a church or a, or a school or some, um, you know, like a community that says, you know, it's going you say, you know, it's going to cost us $3,000 to refurbish this organ, or we could for $300, we could buy a Korg keyboard that has pipe organ sounds in it and it has piano sounds and it has harpsichord and it has a choir all right here in the, uh, let's just get the keyboard we can put under our arm and it doesn't need repaired. So, so these things are being decommissioned all over the world. And so I try to buy up beautiful pipes so that they don't turn into a fireplace kindle, kindling and, um, I'm using those in my instruments. Oh, and it's kind of, I, what I like about it is it's got a computer, it's got a high tech logic, you know, sampling and, I mean, uh, not sampling, I mean, sequencing, mixed with real instruments that are really playing things like cuckoos, like taking cuckoo clocks apart and taking a cuckoo out of it, or the gong, the little uh, spiral gong that's in it. And so that's kind of, that's, that's what I'm doing for fun right now. And for, that's my passion. Uh, excellent. Okay, so this part, we just got a couple more. What sort of samples attract you? What sort of samples attract me? Yeah. Uh, it depends upon what I'm working on. 
you know it's really it really it depends on what you're working on and i'm i look for things uh specifically for projects uh something i like to play with when i get bored is i like uh putting subliminal messages in films and commercials and tv shows because it's so easy to do it's so easy to do you can put your own messages in uh things and um so i look for samples that you can i like voices that that you can hear but you can't hear so i like it when it's like I think my first one I ever did was a Hawaiian Punch commercial. It was the first time I ever did this. And uh, underneath a drum solo, I had to go, sugar is bad for you. And uh, I just remember being at the ad agency and the guy's like tapping his pen on the table and I'm playing it for him and Bob Casale's looking at me and I'm, I'm blushing when it happens because I, I can't, I, I'm not really good at that kind of stuff. So I turn bright red and he's looking at me like, You're, we, we're gonna get fired. And then the guy's tapping his pen and at the end of the commercial the guy goes, yeah, Hawaiian punch does hit you in all the right places. And he just looked at me like, how, how did that happen? <laughs> and so then that started uh, like 30 or 50 commercials in a row before we started just mostly doing them in films and TV. Oh, excellent. Oh, that's great. Okay, and what do you see as sort of what's going to happen next with the techno with technology in music? Where do you sort of see it going? Technology and music? Yeah. Oh, it's changing on so many levels. It's 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 you know it's I don't know. I see things. You see things. You know, it's like kids see things. Kids want things, and then they can give them to them. Um, uh, I was just telling somebody earlier that w I went to the pre premiere of Thor and I heard it through speakers. They were blasting so loud it sounded like a rock concert and you couldn't really hear any of the dialogue. It was just all really loud and crazy. And then I went to see a couple different screenings. And one was with Atmos speakers, which had a lot of separation. And I remember the music, I thought, wow, that's the closest I'm going to hear this music to sounding like when I recorded it at Abbey Road. And uh, it was very clean sounding and the, it, they were able to separate the sound effects and the, and the dialogue and the music in a really enjoyable way on that system. And, and I had just kind of, I kind of, you know, I have uh, my engineer, one of my engineers kept saying, I'm working with Atmos stuff. And he, he had done, um, oh no, the movie where, where this little Indian boy that's out in a, in a, a life raft with a tiger. A Life of Pi. Yeah, a beautiful movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's, he's Michael Dana's engineer also. And, and he was talking about Atmos and all these amazing things. I'm thinking, yeah, it sounded really techy to me. It sounded, but when I heard it, even mine film, which wasn't made for Atmos, it was made for, I don't know, 11.1 .1 or something. And so it was already pretty split out, but just splitting it out like that, it just sounded so great it made me think i wish every theater you could hear it sounding like this 